Hi everybody and welcome. It's Darlene McLennan here, the National Disability Coordination Officer for North and Northwest of Tasmania and also the Manager of ADSET. On behalf of ADSET and ATTEND, I would like to welcome you all to this webinar. Firstly, I'd like to start, to pay, um, start by paying my respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we all are meeting on today and also pay um, my respects to the Elders past and present and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today. Um, as you can see from um, our information we posted on our website, um, post-secondary education environment is rapidly changing um, and a lot of the learning is actually going online. So what tools and skills do students need to ensure they can participate on an equal playing field? I think it's a fantastic topic. So today we're hearing from Darren Britton from La Trobe University and Martin Kelly. Um, Martin um, is a good friend of ADSET. He's actually developed the um, inclusive technology um, resource and information on, on ADSET on our website. And Darren Britton's actually a member of our advisory committee. So it's fantastic to have two of our esteemed colleagues with us today. Martin and Darren will be looking at the changing um, environment of teaching and learning um, for students with disabilities and explore some of the readily available tools and technologies that can assist them in actively engaging in the studies. So now I'll hand over to Martin and Darren and looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome, Darlene. I'm, uh, I'm Darren Britton. Joining me right next to me is Martin. We'll be trying to swap our microphones um, during the presentation as we go through today. And we've got a lot to cover. We know this is a very um, interesting topic um, and topic that inspires much interest as well. Um, we'll try and provide some answers. Um, we have looked at the questions which were sent through um, prior and we've tried to base some of what we've got in the presentation around that. Now, um, before I go on, I'm not going to read our introductions that were on the website as well. Um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which Martin and I are located here at the Bandura um, campus of La Trobe University, University and that is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders past and present. So what do we want to cover today? I think the synopsis that we put online is fairly apt and Darlene pointed that as well. The times are changing. Um, the landscape has changed dramatically for students um, and so we want to look at some at the post-secondary education sector and those technologies that are currently available to students and in some cases staff to assist in removing barriers to education. While we could individually both talk about this for hours, we're going to try and limit this presentation to some of those more burning questions that were raised beforehand prior to the webinar. Um, and with a particular um, focus on the technologies that can assist students with disabilities in engaging with their studies. Now inclusive technologies are broad and in some respects all technologies have some aspect of inclusion built in, otherwise why create something that nobody's going to use. Um, we do have a lot to get through, there will be many slides that we're just going to touch on but the slides will be made available um, after this on AdSet um, and onto the AdSet website. And there's lots of links in there, lots of links off to further articles and to videos showing some of the software and things that we're talking about. Um, in depth. But primarily we'll focus on three things today. I'm going to introduce um, some parts about that changing educational landscape, what's happened over time, um, and part of that role of the student. How has that landscape changed for the student um, over time? And then Martin's going to be looking at you know some of those changing technologies. What has happened um, with these technologies from a few to many um, as we've got Moving on to slide four, we will be announcing some of the slides um, for our uh, JAWS users, etc., to follow along with the copy that they've got um, already. So I want to introduce you to Joe. Um, Joe's our gender neutral student and our go-to student um, for all things that we're going to be looking at to help us navigate these changing landscapes. Joe will also represent um, some of the examples we'll be using where we're going to keep the anonymity of prior students um, and their feedback as private as we can. Joe's flexible and has no restrictions on environment or ability as well. Joe has many abilities and skills um, and Joe has one particular skill that we're certainly interested in today. 
We can slide five. Joe has the ability to time travel. Because of this amazing ability that Joe has, and possibly because Joe spent too much time watching 80s movies, um, we can utilize this particular skill to help us look back at the past because all of our memories um, fade over time and we only remember some of the good things. Um, we want to compare that with the present and hopefully that will help us predict some of what lies ahead and how some of the technologies we'll be looking at later um, are relevant for now and maybe into the future and some of the emerging technologies. So slide six, we've sent Joe back to 2004, our first stop um, in our webinar today. Back when information access was mainly hard copy, um, there was some electronic, there were some websites. Um, a lot of students didn't necessarily have a laptop at the same time or multiple devices, mobile phones were still fairly rare. In terms of studying a subject, a student may have up to 20, 30 um, main resources that were needed, learning resources or e-resources, however you'd like to frame them, per subject. Um, it was largely a linear process in terms of you got the information, you read the information, you commented or um, studied the information and got assessed on that. There was a few assistive technologies, a few big players in the market um, that dealt with you know, really mainstream disabilities. It was primarily face-to-face -face teaching um, there's a few teaching and learning technologies. Some, and Latrobe in particular, we were dabbling into the into the online environment. Most of the learning was done certainly on campus or being present with other people. And we had libraries full of books and photocopiers. Just to give some perspective how things changed certainly over time with that, back in 2004, um, Google was the fifth most popular search engine. Time magazine was recommending that Friendster.com was the website to watch. Um, MySpace had plans to become the major social network online and Facebook was just launching and was finding it hard to find some capital. So in that respect, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Not everything we think is going to happen will happen. Um, so what we're going to do is send Joe off to the future um, where we have a look at the present and hopefully we won't create some time paradox um, for Joe. So slide seven, where are we at in terms of the present day? We've now got hundreds of assistive technologies or inclusive technologies. Have information access is in many ways, shapes and forms. Um, we have some print now in subjects, we have a lot of electronic, um, primarily electronic, and we have things in a wide variety of different formats now. There's different tools, different systems, um, different platforms people are using. We have the number of resources that are needed. I mentioned earlier, you know, 20 to 30 in a subject. It may have been a reading pack. It may have been a collection of some online articles, if you're lucky, or a series of books. We've got subjects with 150, 250 resources, links, um, things for students to use and follow up on. Um, to help them with their studies. Multiply that across multiple subjects the student may be doing and we've now got a much more complicated environment. We've got some face-to-face -face going on. Um, we've got a lot more blended certainly going on with online, offline, and we've got some fully online. So we've got lots of technologies at play now, lots of newer technologies, lots of emerging technologies, and we have a lot of, you know, as this term, digital disruption. So what's changed? Um, moving on to slide eight. Well, certainly the student numbers that support services are looking at, the needs and demands of those students is changing. The staff and student skill levels are changing as well. We'd like to think staff, um, students, sorry, are coming to the university being much more digi digitally literate. Um, that may not necessarily be the case. Um, there's not one or two tools that a student with a disability may need to now navigate and learn. There's multiple tools. Learning teaching modes will be delivered in different ways. Um, we now are certainly in a much more just-in-time teaching model, it seems to be, across the sector. That's the feedback that we're getting and certainly the experience here. Um, the technologies used to access and participate have changed um, dramatically. Um, there's multiple systems since students need to engage with. So one size does not fit all 
anymore. Um, you know, I look back as a saying hindsight at the good old days and say, well, we can convert print across into electronic text. That's fine. Most things were in some kind of print format. Um, we now have numerous videos. Um, it seems to be the increasing platform and audio that's there. So there's challenges related to that. Um, the timeframes and the life cycle, life cycle of the resources that students require has certainly reduced. Um, we've got things which are only available for a limited time or for the time period of um, the subject itself. Um, information that was online at the start of semester may no longer be online, may not be you know, um, uh, in perpetuity anymore. There's an increase in the learning resources required, as we were saying. Um, the students now require more agency, more individual skills, um, and I think that's probably one of the biggest shifts that's starting to happen. Um, and there's numerous single and dual and multiple purpose applications and tools that are coming out of that. So the big thing, I suppose, is that line between the online and offline is blurring. You know, education is something you could go, you could do. It's now integrated into part of students' lives. We're using social media to communicate and some of the tools that students use outside to communicate with them. Some degrees, in some respects, that's good. In other respects, we have students saying, get out of my personal life. I don't want the two things combined. So we're in a tricky gray area. So slide nine. The future. Where are we going? Um, if I add below our timeline from past to present to future, um, and we'd sent Joe off to the future, if I add below that just the technologies and information communication methods and to represent that, um, that, we're, that we've used in the past and that we're currently using, and the never ending expanding options that seems the future holds, we get this rapidly increasing range of information and technologies. And that makes it hard. So realistically, I think this is probably only the tip of the technology and information iceberg. We're moving to micro-credentialing, we're moving to different ways of learning amongst pages and pages of things. So now for the challenging part, how do we predict the future and where these are going? As I demonstrated earlier many times in the past, predicting the future can be very problematic. Um, two of my favorite examples of this, um, in 1903, the president of the Michigan Savings Bank advised Henry Ford's lawyer, Henry Ford's lawyer, not to invest in the Ford Motor Company because the horse is here to stay and the automobile is only a novelty and a fad. Um, to couple with that, in 1946, Daryl uh, Zanuck, a movie producer with 20th Century Fox, is quoted as saying, television won't last because people will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. Um, so as much as we think we know what might be coming, we're not sure. So what will 10 years on look like? I would hazard a guess that just like the past to the present, some barriers will come down, some technologies will solve some of those, but new ones will emerge. Um, I won't go into too much detail as we've got a lot to cover. Let me say, oop, Joe's just contacted us from the future and has let us know that things are looking pretty good. It's not all doom and gloom. Unfortunately, Joe's also let us know that they cannot share any specific information with us for fear of causing a temporal anomaly. So unfortunately there's not too much we'll be able to do there, but I can share with you um, one of my seven C's checklist um, that we use internally for looking at things. So the seven C's checklist that I've developed over the past decade helps, um, helps me evaluate subjects for student access without knowing about students' individual needs. It's a broad concept taken from many best practice models and frameworks such as universal design, the web content accessibility guidelines, along with student feedback that we've received over the last 14, 15 years here at La Trobe. And it helps us facilitate some discussions around minimizing um, barriers to information access and teaching and learning environments. It's about communication. Is it clear information? the expectations made clear as well. Is there consistency in the presentation, location of information that's there, the style of how that's presented within a subject? The context there, why is this link here? Why would I put it there? Why do you need to go and use it for? There's the choice, the flexibility, multiple formats or options. There's control, giving the user the ability to customize, download content, disseminate content in different ways. There's channels for contribution for the student, provide feedback and to engage as well. And then there's the compliance, which is a very difficult one. I know there were some questions around this earlier, around you know standards-based. Um, 
things becoming technology agnostic. It's not you just have to use this platform or you have to log in and be a user um, of this website and register in order to use things. Now, I know that it's a huge sphere of things to cover very quickly, but that's just trying to set a very brief landscape of where we're at um, at the moment. So I'd like to throw over to Martin, um, who will take you through some of the um, teaching and learning and inclusive technologies that are available to students. Take it away, Martin. Thanks very much, Darren. That was uh, really interesting to kind of sit back and uh, listen to the overview that you presented of the changes that have happened. Um, really quite amazing to see what's happened in the last uh, 10 or so years. So I'm going to start off with a screenshot of the inclusive technology section of AdSet's website. Um, that uh, section of the website was completed around this time last year and it has some great information on it. Uh, obviously it has a lot of information to do with assistive technologies uh, and that information is grouped by disability type. Uh, there are also some video resources of students talking about their experiences of, of using assistive technology and it's very useful to show other students this. Students learning from other students is, is always a good thing. Uh, the other thing it has on there, it has information on where you can purchase various technologies. Okay, moving on to the next slide. How have assistive technologies evolved within the context that Darren has just described? Well, there's the subscription model of providing software, which some, a small number of assistive technologies are starting to use. Text help reading write gold for Google Chrome now has a subscription model, as does Sonocent Audio Note Taker. The advantage to it is that it has ongoing technical support and updates. You've always got the most updated version of the product. And this is in line with what a lot of other major software companies such as Adobe are doing. Another thing that has, that has been happening is that a lot of software licenses are now device agnostic. So you can purchase a license and it can be used on either a Windows or Mac machine. Uh, and in addition, there might be an app version of the product uh, that um, either is a scaled down version of it or supplements um, some of the functions that uh, the main software does. We've also seen that some licensing, not all, certainly not all licensing, but there are some good examples of, of flexible licensing. And I mentioned Sonocent Audio Note Taker again, which I'm going to be talking about Sonocent a bit later. Uh, the license managing system is an, an easy to use online managing system, management system where I can assign a license to a student for a given period. When that student's finished using that license after that period, I can either extend the license loan for that student or I can give that particular license to another student. Uh, I've also uh, listed Google, uh, listed text help Google Chrome, um, if a student has a license for that, they can log in using any computer that has uh, text help on it and they can uh, sign into it via the, the Chrome extension on their device. Moving on to the next slide, which is slide 13. Um, there's been a partnering that multinational companies have initiated with uh, some of the smaller assistive technology brands. So non-visual desktop access, a screen reader, has been working quite a bit with Microsoft over the years uh, to make their products uh, compatible with each other to improve accessibility. Google has been working with TextHelp and BrailleNote for the same reason. Another thing that's been happening within the environment is that the native accessibility of some web browsers and operating systems has really improved. I've mentioned Google Voice Type there and I'm going to be talking about that a bit later. Microsoft's speech recognition and Mac dictation are also pretty good. And the Mac VoiceOver screen reader is very good for uh, users who require a screen reader on a, on, on a Mac computer. So also over the, um, over the years, single purpose apps, and there's a lot of text to speech apps whose, whose sole purpose is to read text that's on the screen. Um, single purpose apps have become much more reliable. When apps were first released onto the market, they were often a, an isolated project that a developer was doing. They would work for a while, but then you would find 
that they wouldn't work after that. The good thing is that there are a lot of stayers in the market now and there are a lot of good reliable apps and they're usually fairly low cost in relation in comparison to the big names in in software. Okay, we're going to move on to the next slide, which is slide number uh, we're having a bit of a debate here, Darren and I, whether it's slide number 14 or 13. Okay, it's slide number 13. Okay, and it's it's got it's written down there. Uh, I want to talk uh, in the next uh, few slides about screen readers. I will be moving on to other assistive technologies. So uh, um, I have a screenshot of a graph um, and it's from the WebAIM screen reader survey that was done in 2015. A few things to point out on this survey that you'll be able to notice um, is that there is, it has been a decline in the uses of JAWS as a screen reader and there has been a rising popularity in Zoom text, Windows and NVDA, which is, as I mentioned before, non-visual desktop access. It should also be noted that the rise in popularity of Windows eyes at the point when this survey was done might be partly attributed to the fact that it became freely available alongside the purchase of Windows. Now the 2017 version of this survey, well I'm hoping there will be, a, I'm guessing there will be a 2017 version of the survey because they seem to do one every couple of years. Uh, it will be interesting to see how, how, how things change and if they do change. Uh, there is a link at the top of this page to a full description of the survey on the WebAIM website, so go there for more information if you're interested. Moving on to slide 14, I want to talk about NVDA and JAWS. And the reason I want to talk about the two screen readers is that they are often compared. Um, now the comparisons that are often made between the two applications I, I find are sometimes based on what people have heard about the two products years ago. So, for example, in 2006, when NVDA was released, many people compared it to JAWS, and it was commonly said that JAWS was much better, which at that point in time, it certain, JAWS was, certainly was much better. NVDA VDA had just come on the scene, and JAWS had been around for um, more than 10 years. Uh, let's have a look at some of the differences between NVDA and JAWS. So, as I said before, NVDA was released in 2016 and JAWS was released in 1995. NVDA is free, it's funded by companies such as Microsoft. JAWS, you have to pay for a license and it is quite expensive. Both are compatible with Windows. Now, I'm going to get a bit geeky here just for a few seconds. NVDA uses accessibility APIs to read information on the screen and Windows uses its video intercept driver. The difference here is that there might be some programs on your computer that don't support accessibility APIs and as I'm told if that's the case NVDA might not work with those programs. The main question that I'm interested in is this, in 2017 when it comes to using NVDA and JAWS with Microsoft applications and web browsers is there really that much difference in functionality when you compare the two? Now I can't say that I've done a formal study on this, I, I certainly haven't, but from my experience of working with students in recent years and from reading available information on websites and forums, there really doesn't, there really doesn't seem to be that much of a difference. You do sometimes hear NVDA provides so, more audio information when reading online forms. Now some users like this and some users don't like it. I spoke to Quentin Christensen at NVA, that's non-visual access, mm -hmm. about this particular issue recently and he explained that there are some settings within NVDA that can be changed to minimise that kind of auditory information. Um, I've also included a slide, uh, I've also included on this slide a link to an interesting article about switching from JAWS to NVDA and some things to expect and Joe, our uh, our, our anonymous uh, student recommends that you have a bit of a look at that. Moving on to the next slide, slide number 15, Zoom Text Fusion 11. So what is G Zoom Text Fusion 11? Well, the makers of JAWS, that's Freedom Scientific, and the makers of Zoom Text, that's AI Squared, got together and had a baby and they called it Zoom Text Fusion 11. So, 
basically Zoom Text Fusion 11 is a combination of both JAWS and Zoom Text. So the rationale behind it is to provide a product that meets the needs of the user whose vision is changing over time. Another thing to consider about this product is that it's a cheaper way for an institution to, to purchase a license of JAWS and Zoom Text. Now I would recommend having a look at the link to the video and auditory information about the product because to me the idea of bringing a screen magnification software and a screen reader software and, and these two particular softwares together makes a lot of sense. Moving to the next slide, slide 16. Now MAPS has been one of those areas where assistive technology has often struggled. There have been some products out there on the market, but nothing that's really taken off. When I was in Sydney in May at the Text Help and Google EdTech event, Equatio was one of the new products being spoken about and I saw a demonstration of it and I was pretty impressed. So basically it's a Text Help product which is a Google Chrome extension. There's a free version of it and there's a, a version, a, a paid license that you can purchase. Uh, it creates maths expressions that use equations and formulas. It has handwriting recognition via uh, touch um, screen and touchpad. It also has voice recognition and the ability to type equations. So look, it's, it's certainly a product that I'm looking forward to introducing to students and I'm looking forward to seeing how well it works. There are a couple of links on this slide that give you more information about Equatio. So as Darren mentioned, it's a good idea after this webinar to download the PowerPoint slides because there are loads of links on them. Moving along to the next slide, slide number 17, voice recognition. So what's been happening in the world, world of voice recognition? Well, quite a bit over the last number of years. I'll just start by referring to a couple of reviews of voice recognition technologies in 2017. Now, I've got links to these reviews at the top of the PowerPoint slide. Both reviews put Dragon at the top of, list, of the list. And the reason for this has to do with the accuracy of voice recognition in relation to dictation, uh, the ability to customise the vocabulary uh, to add specialist terms, the ability to navigate operating systems and voice commands, the ability to customise commands and use macros. Uh, in addition, Dragon has a medical version which has a, a huge medical vocabulary and also has a legal version which has a, a huge vocabulary related to law. So having said that, it, it's really important to also know about upper voice dictation technology because a lot of it has come a long way. Now I've got three um, technologies listed there. Google Voice Type, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide, uh, is very good. Um, the Google, uh, Google's vocab and, and Google's accent recognition uh, has been developed by feeding into the data for, from Android phone users and, and so it's got a massive database that it utilises when recognising words. Uh, I've also mentioned Mac Dictation and Windows 10 speech recognition. They're also good. Um, one thing I would say, regardless of uh, what technology you're going to use, is definitely use a good noise cancelling microphone. You might find that um, you know, the, the microphone, the inbuilt microphone on your laptop works when the room is quiet, but if you just get a bit of background noise, it, it really, the accuracy really falls down. Um, so moving on to the next slide, slide 18, uh, and talking a bit about Google voice typing, one thing I should point out to start off with is Google voice typing does only work uh, within Google Docs. Um, so I've got a screenshot of a demonstration of Google Voice Type that I did. And of the five sentences that are in that screenshot, you'll notice, or, or if you're a um, screen reader, if you read the alt text, you'll notice that there's not an error in, it, in any of them. Uh, one thing that I do notice when dictating with applications like Google Voice Type is that uh, it doesn't recognize punctuation and formatting as well as what Dragon would. Um, and the other thing to, to point out about these products is that they are usually just limited to dictation. They're not limited, they, 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 you can't um, navigate through um, uh, an operating system using voice commands or uh, navigate through menus within a Word doc or a um, web browser using commands. So they are limited to, 
to dictation of words. Now there is a, uh, a link to a video on how to use Google type, voice typing. Um, I would recommend sharing that with um, people, it's, it's very good. Now moving along to slide number 19, uh, text-to-speech software. So many devices now have some form of converting text information to audio. Um, it, it's usually part of an operating system. Uh, some of the paid for products are much better in terms of usability and they will often have voices that, that are also much easier on the ear, I suppose. Uh, we've got a couple listed there, uh, text allowed for PCs, ghost reader for Macs. Also don't forget about the um, assistive technology section of the AdSet website, it has additional information about uh, text-to-speech software. Um, many of the ebook readers now have text-to-speech functionality built, built in. Uh, Google Play Store, you can get Moon Reader. And uh, uh, e-reader Prestigio uh, is also available. And down at the bottom of this slide, there is a link to Tom's guide, uh, which has uh, a list of the best e-readers on the market. So, moving along to slide 20. Sonocent Audio Note Taker, one of the more impressive educational technologies that's come out on the market in recent years, I think. Uh, I've got a screenshot of a demonstration video, um, from a demonstration video in this slide. And there's also a link to a four minute video that I did that demonstrates Sonocent and it gives a really quick uh, demonstration and some instructional information as well on Sonocent Audio Note Taker. Sonocent's one of those products, it's kind of, it's best to actually see how it works. I'm going to give it an attempt to describe some of its functionality, but um, it is, you get the gist very quickly if you watch the video of, of, of a lot of things that Sonocent can do. So in this screenshot, it has the main interface of the Sonocent Audio Note Taker software, and you can see that there are three columns. In the first column, the column on the left, you can see there are PowerPoint slides that have been imported. So you can import your PowerPoint slides into the software. In the second column, it's titled text, and that's where you can add your notes. You can type your notes uh, during the course of when the audio recording is occurring. You can type your notes alongside the relevant slide. The third column allows you to group the audio by means of chunking it alongside the, the, the relevant slide and text. Um, as I say, watch the video, you'll get the idea. Now it does a lot of other things, uh, Sonocent Audio Note Taker, but it would take me too long to go through them. Happy to talk to you more about that. Staff and students that I've been training in Sonocent are really excited about it. Um, it's interesting at one educational institution, I've been um, training students in Sonocent. Um, I've also been introducing them to LiveScribe Smart Pen. Some students, depending on the nature of their disability and the content of their study, are opting to use LiveScribe Smart Pen. And for me, it's, it's, it, just a, it was just a reminder that it's a good idea to give students a choice where there is a choice. Um, and it's also a reminder that Smart Pen is a really good bit of technology um, that is very relevant to education and disability. And as I say, some students will prefer to use it. Um, it's, it's a good idea to, to um, keep students informed about what's out there. Okay, so um, I suppose Sonocent also, one last point about it, it is unique in that it does merge multiple formats um, and there's nothing quite like it. So slide 21 is what we're on now. Um, what changes are happening in the area relating to students who are deaf and hard of hearing? Now, we are going to be um, uh, posting um, some questions out after this webinar, um, asking institutions how they are, are going about captioning, and um, so we, we do want to gather some information about that, because we do understand it's, um, it is a, 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 a discussion that's, that's like, a, like a lot of others, it's ongoing, but it's a discussion that um, that a lot of people are interested in hearing about. I'm just going to cover some things. So the Phonak devices uh, that link in with hearing aids and cochlear implants are really beautifully streamlined, unobtrusive technologies. They're becoming more and more used. Um, and there's a link to the Phonak website on this slide. 
the cardionic stethoscopes have headphones that work with or without hearing aids and cochlear implants and they're also readily available on the market. And there's of course the Bellman FM transmitters and receivers uh, that are also very handy things for disability liaison units to have uh, as a resource to loan out to students. Now a question did come through in the webinar form asking whether there uh, is technology that assists Auslan use, Auslan use, um, users. So apart from captioning and uh, remote video for Auslan interpreter, there are some things happening that I would describe as being in the research and development phase. Unfortunately, um, the, the, the research and development is happening in America, so they're developing it for American Sign Language. But um, there is more information on this slide. Uh, there's a product called the iCommunicator. As I say, it's very relatively new. Uh, it converts, it claims to convert speech or text to video American Sign Language. The makers of the product do state it's not intended as a replacement for sign language interpreters, but as an alternative when an interpreter is not available. And I've also got an, an, a link to an interesting article on technology that, that is being developed to convert American Sign Language to text. Moving along to the next slide, which is slide number 22. I've listed a number of productivity and time management apps on, these, uh, on this slide. These apps are free and some of them are quite fun. For example, the app called Forest aims at limiting the time that someone accesses their phone by having a timer represented by a tree growing. If the user starts using their phone during the period that the tree is growing, then it will begin to wither. The longer you don't touch your smartphone, the better the tree will grow. I know a few people, some of my friends that should get that. I've also listed one app to do with grammar. Uh, and that's Grammarly. It's probably one of the more popular apps out there in, in that area. And again, uh, there's a free version of that app available. So moving on to the next slide. Um, slide 23. Now this slide I've put last, but it's certainly by no means the least important. And as you can see, Joe is there with a microscope looking at it with some interest. Uh, the SET framework is a framework that I use and a lot of people um, who are introducing assistive technology to students use. It was developed by Joy Zabala a number of years ago. And the reason it's important is because it, it looks at technology within the context of the big picture. The SET, um, SET itself is an acronym that stands for student environments, tasks, and tools. So in relation to the student, when meeting a student and uh, evaluating what technology is relevant to them, the SET framework says, well, look at the student's learning strengths. How are they already going about accessing their materials and uh, demonstrating their skills and knowledge? What strengths do they have? Acknowledge those strengths and, and encourage the student to, to, to use those strengths. Um, it asks, what's the impact of the disability or health condition on learning? And it also asks, well, what are the student's goals and interests? Um, the E in SET stands for environments. And it takes into account where the technology will be used. And as Darren was outlining the blended learning environment, the students don't, um, if the things have changed for, for, for Joe over the years, uh, it's common place for a student to learn as much of their stuff online as what it is at the actual educational institution. And of course, students also have work placements in many cases. So they're going to need to use the technology in, in the environments that are relevant to them. But also, in, in the environments that they're in, what learning supports do the students have? Can they meet with their lecturer or their tutor face to face and ask questions? Are they going to the study and learning center to develop skills? The T in the second last T in set stands for tasks. What tasks does the stu student need to do? So this kind of relates to conversations about inherent requirements. Um, the last T uh, stands for tool. So tools. So based on the above information, 
what assistive technology is relevant to the student, but not only what assistive technology is relevant for the student, what other resources such as training and technical support would the student require to, to assist them to integrate the technology into their daily study routine? So often this just doesn't happen overnight, as, as, as we say. It, it, ta it can take a while particularly for a student who really relies heavily on assistive technology, it can take them a while to bring in the technology to their day-to-day -day study routine. I know that I often say to students who are taking up the use of um, uh, assistive technology when they start a, a degree or a, or a, um, a, a certificate, I often say to them, well, look, you're doing uh, an overload, you're actually doing an extra subject and that extra subject is learning how to use your assistive technology. So this set framework is very good, it's a holistic way of considering um, technology, it just doesn't see technology as the um, thing that can uh, be the one solution. In some cases assistive technology is the solution to a student's problem but in Perhaps in more, more often uh, than not, students require assistive technology and other additional supports as well. So thanks for listening to me. We are interested in listening to you, of course, and so it's probably a good point just to stop there. Uh, we've got a, a slide up now that shows um, Darren's contact details and my contact details. Please feel welcome to contact us. Um, Moving along. Um, thank you, Martin. Starting. That's brilliant. That's absolutely thank fantastic. Um, yes, I'm definitely going to the App Store after we speak and downloading Forest. <laughs> I think I'm probably one of those people that require it. So, thank you for that. Um, just encourage people if they have any questions, they can um, put it into the question pod. Um, if we don't get to them today, um, we will certainly have them answered and, and put on the website afterwards. Um, we have had a question in the pod that's a very important question and it's one to Jo. Um, we want to, um, the person would like to uh, wonder if you could ask Jo if um, they could tell us who's going to win the 2020 US election. Um, just checking with Jo, hang on, it just takes a little while to go across the decades. Um, <laughs> No, yeah, Joe wait. said due to publishing rights, um, <laughs> can't release that information again. Very We've good. already got a bit of a time paradox happening. We don't want another one. So Very good. And guys, your jokes were fantastic. I felt um, quite sad that you couldn't hear us all chuckle along with you because I certainly had some moments of, um, of chuckling. So it was fantastic to, to hear your humour coming through in the presentations. Um, so we have had a couple of questions um, that we received prior to the webinar. Um, one of the one of the ones that um, I would would like to find out, I suppose, is how is um, from La Trobe's experiencing his experience handling audio transcriptions for interactive um, and um, classes and discussions. Oh, that one dreaded question. Um, oh, was that the one you didn't want <laughs> yeah, me to ask? That's right. <laughs> as um, I think, no, thanks, Ali. As and it's a good reference because um, I think in the follow-up survey to this, we're going to try and ask what um, different institutions and organisations are doing. This is certainly an emerging area, as Martin touched on. There's a few applications that help with some of this. Um, uh, voice to text recognition, but the learning and teaching environment is we have much more video, we have a lot more audio visual material being used, these resources, lectures are recording, we've got students studying everywhere, again we've got you know, students using different technologies on different devices at different times, you know, it's very much user driven, um, but when it comes to that side of it, it's still not that great, um, you can get really good um, automatic transcription, um, only if the system knows the voice, it's in a perfect environment, there's no background noise, as Martin was saying, you know, get noise cancelling microphone, and unfortunately that's the environment, most of the videos that we have, most of the um, recordings in terms of education, even at La Trobe, um, and I know a lot of other um, universities use um, the Lectopia system, it, the quality is just not there for the automatic transcription. While that's becoming much better, you know, YouTube, 
Google has been doing a lot of work certainly on that. The confidence level still not that great. As soon as you get two talkers or you get some background noise or you get somebody with a slight accent or talking too fast, as I do, um, you'll find that it just doesn't happen. Hence the same reason that we've got a steno captioner here today. Somebody can hear what we're saying, has human intentions, etc. I might just quickly add to a slide as well. Um, uh, when we put this online, there's a really interesting article on why voice uh, recognition um, in terms of auto captioning and that isn't there yet. And I'm just going to throw it to Martin for a second. Uh, I'll just add to that. A couple of weeks ago, Microsoft made an announcement um, that its voice recognition uh, of multiple voices was more accurate than a transcriber. Uh, they did. They presented a um, a paper um, of how they um, uh, made this claim, I suppose. Um, so we might put a uh, link to that up as well. But you know, you, you do have to kind of evaluate these things, and and uh, these things have to be proved out there in the um, in the. I hate to use the term real world, but out there uh, in places like our lecture theatres, meeting rooms and other venues. So um, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll add that one to it as well. Excellent. Um, just somebody's asked also, also is how is it best to enable students to trial and learn some of these new technologies from your experiences? So yeah, good question. Um, so to trial and trial it and to, to learn how to use the technologies, I guess I'm engaging with students um, and making the the uh, opportunities available is certainly um, you know number one. Mm. I do find that having stu when a student actually sees how a product works, I do find that that can be very powerful. Um, I've had experiences of um, students who are screen reader users and who perhaps um, aren't uh, that skilled with their screen reading technology. I've had experiences of uh, getting them to meet a, a screen reader user who is very experienced at using it. And it's a really powerful uh, learning experience for that student to, to actually learn from another student and, and see it in action. Um, I do also think that when um, uh, stuff like voice dictation drag is being um, introduced to a student, it does need to uh, be uh, provided with some training. Just providing students software out of a box uh, isn't always the best. Is, isn't the best idea, I don't think. Um, training alongside of it, face-to-face uh, -face training is really good. Um, another thing to point out is you really want to make these things work well. You want demonstrations to be good demonstrations. I mean, if I was going to go out and buy a car today, and it um, didn't work for some reason, you know, I wouldn't be buying the car. And the same thing goes with assistive technology. You want students to see this work, and you want to see it working well. Um, and you do also want to acknowledge the fact that it can take a while for a student to uh, integrate the, the technology into their daily study routines. And so uh, ask the question too, okay, um, is the technology al alone the solution? As I mentioned before, um, it often isn't. So for example, if I was to give a student some mind mapping software and uh, the software itself isn't going to teach the student how to mind map. The student is going to need to learn how to, the concept of mind mapping and how to do mind mapping. The software itself is just a tool. Voice dictation. Dictating to a computer is very different to talking to a person. The student is going to need, or anyone's going to need, to kind of learn how to talk to a computer. And often it's good to have someone there to give them some feedback about how they're going. Um, because most of us aren't usually used to listening to our voices, unless you're a singer, unless you're an actor, unless you're a, a newsreader. So it's um, one of those things. Uh, yeah, it's a multi. There are a number of answers to that question. Okay. I might. Sorry, Darlene. No, it's Darren. I might just um, quickly add to that. Um, sorry, can you just mute that? Sorry, just. 
Oh, it is. That's all right. Sorry. Um, I might just add to that. I think it's very important. We've certainly found over time in terms of uh, you know alternate formats and student needs changing, you know, over the last you know, fifteen odd years. That time frame thing that Martin talked about and that ownership going back to the student, I think is really key. Uh, the assumption we make when we say this is the best bit of software for you is primarily the wrong assumption in most cases. It will be what they can adapt and build into their current routine. It will need to replace something they're already doing. Again, if we look, something's 100% full, we can't add another 10% cognitive load onto it without taking something away. And that only happens over time. We know from experience introducing new formats to students saying, you know, you should use, uh, well not say we should, um, here's an EPUB or here's a DAISY book for instance and here's these things. The uptake of those new technologies is really slow for the students and it has to be done at their time frame. Um, and we've generally found that's a six to 12 month time frame. So we can give somebody the software, get them to play with it, remind them to play with it when they've got time to integrate that into what they do. And the more that that technology can be part of their life outside of education, where this will help them with their you know, social media, will help them with other things that they're doing, the more likely that is to be adopted. Then we get those students back to primarily you know, be the peer, as you're saying, for another student to see what this is, but there's a point of your own ownership. Once you've, you know, it's the same thing. If I tell you go listen to this song, it's fantastic. You won't think it as great as what I will. But if you discover it yourself, and somebody's just pointed you in that direction, then you'll have a different love affair um, with that. If that makes sense. Sorry. It does. No, I like it. <laughs> but I'd listen to anything you recommend, Darren. It's fine. Um, just a question on Chloe Reader um, and go to it. Is that how you pronounce it? Has anybody done any comparison about um, um, and Read and Write Gold? Have anybody done any comparison of those technologies? Um, I have done a comparison on Clara Reader and uh, Read and Write Gold. I've got them both on the my laptop. Um, Read and Write Gold is much more user friendly. Um, Claro Read, at the time that I purchased it a couple of years ago, uh, there were some bugs in it. It wasn't working that well with um, uh, Word, and the company acknowledged that themselves. Um, but they and they did provide a fix to it um, at at some point. Uh, so just in terms of user friendliness, um, definitely uh, Text Help is. Uh, is is much better. Uh, no, I haven't done a comparison with uh, Go to it. No, that's okay. Um, all right. Well, looking at the time, we might finish up. We have got a number of other questions, but we might put them on the um, the website and um, we'll have them all answered. Um, just before we finish up, I just want to tell people about our next webinar, which will be. Um, one of our other wonderful colleagues, Kathy East from Griffith University, she had the um, wonderful opportunity to go to the Association of Higher Education and Disability Conference in America, and she will be um, ho holding a will be holding a webinar on the 27th of September, Wednesday, the 27th of September, at 1 p.m. Hearing from um, Kathy and her experience um, from that conference, and there's kind of quite a lot of new. Um, kind of things happening in America that I think hopefully will come our way um, and probably some of the similar discussions and issues that we're facing. So that's coming up um, later on in this month. So thank you very much Martin and Darren. Um, it was a very informative um, presentation. Uh, it was timely because I'm actually presenting next week to a career practitioners around technology so it's um, great to have touched base and actually found some new, um, new technologies as well today. So thank you both for your time. I've, I think you've done an enormous effort in, in providing the wealth of information. Um, we will be posting the uh, PowerPoint presentation on our website so everybody can go to the um, presentation and um, click on the links um, and do some further research themselves. So thank you and thank you everybody who has participated today.